You're listening to the Becoming More Me podcast with me, Teresa Lear Levine. You're already enough, but if you're anything like me, you thrive when you're stretching and developing yourself, creating more of the person you feel called to be. This podcast is here to inspire and support you. Let's release the negative, reinforce the positive, and elevate our vibe together as we tap into our limitless potential to transform and grow. Hello, hello, hello. Today, we're going to talk about high-functioning anxiety. Yes, it is a topic that I kind of brought up casually in last week's episode, and something that I'm kind of embarrassed I haven't brought up many, many times before because it's something that I have had for a really long time, and didn't realize that's what it was until more recent years, but it can go so commonly hand in hand with ADHD, which I've been talking about more and more recently that I felt like, man, I can't keep this under wraps any longer. And I know that so much of my listenership deals with this too, and might not realize it themselves either. So I'd like to just kind of shine a little bit of a light into the corner of high functioning anxiety today, get some bearings about what it is, how it shows up, that kind of stuff, and just open the door to more conversations about this in the future. So I help a lot of people that have high functioning anxiety and much like helping people that have trauma, ADHD, and the challenges of being mompreneurs. These are all things that I've personally worked with on myself and worked through with the methods and modalities that I help other people with. So it puts me in a place of great empathy and understanding when I'm helping other people through these things. And allows me to coach in a little bit of a different way than perhaps someone who hasn't lived with it themselves. And it's part of the reason why it's so important that we have this discussion today, because I don't know that I would have realized that this is what I was dealing with five or 10 years ago, even. And once I was able to put a finger on what high functioning anxiety is, it really revealed a lot of patterns and behaviors and things to me that I had either been thinking or something else or just hadn't identified or recognized. And it's made untangling my own mental mess easier. And that's what it's all about, right? Having good coping mechanisms, having simple ways to manage the things that otherwise can really wash over us in negative and lasting ways. So high functioning anxiety isn't a diagnosis or a disorder or anything that you're going to find in a book with a definition or that your doctor is going to say, oh, you have high functioning anxiety, but it tends to refer to People who experience anxiety, but even though they do, they're very, they're overachievers. They are successful. They're doing amazing things, but they're still living with a high level of anxiety a lot of times, all the time. You know, just this kind of consistent, persistent level of anxiety that underlies everything they do but yet they're still successful. And again, oftentimes they're overachievers. And that also leads to them tending to be a little unsatisfied sometimes and typically kind of hard on themselves. So the anxiety in this case normally has an effect of helping them to move forward rather than an anxiety that might prevent somebody from success or achievement, um, achieving a goal, what have you. So that's a little bit of a difference there because in both cases there's anxiety, but in one case it's a driver and in another case it is the block. So very different presentations that happen when you're dealing with high functioning anxiety. So 
I want to kind of look at some ways that it can show up so that you can kind of identify like, is that what I'm dealing with or is it something else? So are you somebody that always wants to finish things on your own? Like, do you have trouble asking for help in your life or assistance or delegating things and you just kind of want to do it all yourself? That can be a little bit telltale sometimes, as well as, and this can go hand in hand, although this is not one that I present with, trouble saying no to people and taking on more than you can handle, which then also tends to elevate the anxiety and add to that that whole phenomenon that's going on. Um, Now, people that have trouble saying no sometimes also fall into that whole like people-pleasing sort of category and an emotional need to do that as well. Also, not me, (laughs) but that's, uh, it could have been me. Decades ago, I might have had trouble saying no to things. And no is like, honestly, one of my favorite things to say anymore. No, 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 no. I don't have any trouble saying no. And I've, I put a lot less emphasis and importance on what anybody else might think about it. So I'm, that's something I'm very grateful for in my life. And those things, people pleasing and lack of ability to say no are part of a lack of boundaries. So if you have a really difficult time with that mythical work-life balance, which I think we all do, honestly, but if it's particularly burdensome for you to even feel like you're remotely balancing the two, you may be dealing with this. And just feelings of overwhelm. If you're feeling constantly like the world, your projects, the pace of everything is faster than you could ever possibly stay on top of or keep up with, and you're really having that feeling of overwhelm and like things are just, just knocking you over, coming over you in waves, that kind of thing, then that can also be a symptom, a thing you might notice in somebody who is experiencing high functioning anxiety. And burnout, of course, goes hand in hand with overwhelm. So if you're living in periods of high overwhelm, then it's a lot more likely that you can find yourself burnt out, just really fatigued. I know that I have gone through periods of burnout and I was often just like, gosh, no, I have such good energy. Why am I burnt out? Maybe it's my, my hormones. Maybe it's adrenal fatigue. Maybe I was looking at all these different corners, but it didn't occur to me during those previous periods of burnout that my anxiety had worn me the down and I was just dunno. And I can still find myself in those states. I think I might've talked about it on the last episode that um, I'll hold myself at such a high level of attention and responsibility and need to stay on top of everything while my husband's away on business travel or something's going on where I'm just kind of responsible for all the things and, you know, the kids, my work, all the other household duties and such that when he returns and I'm able to relax, even just a smidge, I just like, I zonk out. I'll either like take a long nap or I will sleep like a baby that night or just kind of collapse. And I'm exhausted is what it comes down to mentally exhausted. And it's just, the stress has been prolonged for just too long and my body needs to recover, but that can be a telltale sign of high functioning anxiety and something that I've gotten a lot better about preparing for and dealing with like the crashes that I used to have guys, like when he would come back from a trip, it would sometimes be like the whole weekend or several days of just this really exhausted state and just not even understanding at all. Like, why am I so exhausted? I'm fit. I, you know, I work out every day. I eat well, I'm hydrated. 
why do I just want to sit here and do nothing? And why is my mind not functioning with clarity? And why do I feel like just somebody has turned off the switch and I can't turn it back on is how it would feel. And that also is a sign. So if, if you just simply consider yourself an overachiever, that can also just go hand in hand, like overachiever, high functioning anxiety. Um, because that's not saying somebody who has achieved a lot, that's saying somebody who is always focused on working harder, doing more, achieving more, you know, getting to more milestones, doing more. And we all need to learn to be more and not do more and to realize these states of consciousness that we can get into where we can achieve everything we want and then some through being and not doing. Now that's high level shit for another episode, (laughs) but um, the point is we don't have to live and work in ways that run ourselves down and exhaust ourselves in order to get to the end goal that we think is the most important thing. There are ways that we can alter our states and get there without having to stress so freaking much along the way and suck every last bit of enjoyment out of the actual goal achievement. Because that is not the goal, is it? Nobody's ever like, I want to achieve this amazing goal. And while I'm doing it, I want to be miserable, burnt out, run down, mentally exhausted, no real service or use to my family, not feeling present in my day-to-day moments, not getting to enjoy, cherish, and appreciate the things I say I value most. And that's how I'm going to achieve my goal. Said no one freaking ever, right? And yet that is the way that people with high functioning anxiety go about achieving goals. And I know because it's how I used to go about it too. And it sucked. So just putting that out there in case there's anybody out there that is chasing goals passionately, but with complete disregard to their own quality of life. And even sometimes the quality of life of those around them while they scurry, hustle, grind, all these things that are actually unnecessary for their goal achievement. Okay. Just a little something to chew on there. And type A personalities. Hmm. Got that too. That's also, you know, full of traits that are going to present themselves as high functioning anxiety. So just that, that big time ambition that need to be highly organized. And I'll put that out there because, you know, high functioning anxiety, ADHD, a lot of times organization is a huge downfall for people with ADHD, but with high functioning anxiety, a lot of times you'll find yourself like making a list about your list, breaking down your list into more lists, uh, looking at your calendar in five different ways, the digital, the written, the post-it notes, the like just highly organized. I know that when I was doing my taxes, (laughs) we recently kind of transitioned to a clean slate in our financial management software. And God, I was looking through the categories and subcategories that we had for like the last uh, half dozen or more years in our financial software. 296 subcategories. Might as well just say 300. That's ridiculous. So I took like a whole day in January and was like, I mean, it had been driving me crazy, honestly, for like two years. I just hadn't done anything about it because I had recognized it and I knew that it was excessive and over the top and ultra crazy, stupid organized. But fixing it took time too, and simplification and all that kind of stuff that just doesn't always come easily to me. So it wasn't until 
we, um, we took on a new tax preparer this year. And I said to him, I'm like, I want to be really involved in these processes. I want to understand my money better than ever. And I also want help simplifying the way that I've been tracking things. And he totally helped me to simplify. He's like, this is all you need. And anything else is just kind of, you know, if you want to do it fine, but it's not necessary for what I need to do to help you. So you can save the time too. It's like, that's exactly what it is about at the end of the day. Anything that I can do that gets me back more of my valuable time is something I want to do. As long as it still speaks to the same goal of being able to easily, in fact, more easily prepare for our taxes next year in a more simple way, that's awesome. So anyway, that, that whole, you know, type A over-organized and, you know, competitive, I don't, I'm competitive about certain things, but not like the typical competitive, like sports and teams and things like that. That's not me, but I can be very competitive about my business goals and things like that. And that drives me, but overworking can also be a key indicator that you're dealing with the old HFA, the high functioning anxiety. So if you're somebody that feels like you cannot be still with yourself, you constantly need to be doing something like busy is a badge of achievement. You might be doing this. And that is something that definitely used to be me and something that I, I have to remain conscious of because I can easily get back there. And I've worked through my shiz on this one. And I know there are themes of avoidance and numbing and just not wanting to sit with certain feelings. And I've taken the time to sit with them and to use EFT tapping to get through them. And boy, I can show up differently since I've done that. And you know what? It wasn't painful and it wasn't as difficult as I liked to tell myself it was going to be before I did the work. So important to know guys, because I know somebody out there that's listening to this is avoiding doing self-work on something because you don't want to revisit it. You think it's going to hurt. You think that it's going to be more painful to face that bothersome memory, that habit, that reality that you're living with right now. And then it, then it is to just keep living with it. And it's not true. It's you, you can tell yourself a better lie than that guys. And if you need help working through it, that's the stuff I help people with, you know, working through traumas, working through those feelings that are so tough to sit with and learning how to just be with yourself the way you are worthy and enough working towards your goals, releasing goal trauma and becoming that greatest version of you that is honestly already in there. Okay. So if you're, if you're an overworker, if you're just constantly busy, constantly go, 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 won't sit with yourself. Won't, won't get calm and still you're probably carrying around a pretty high level of stress from high functioning anxiety. And perfectionism is also a really big player here. So I consider myself a recovering perfectionist and I look at it much the way that an alcoholic looks at being a recovering alcoholic. Like once you're a perfectionist it's you're kind of always one, but you're learning ways to get further and further away from it and to you know, build those, those coping mechanisms and those beliefs and things that allow you to know that, you know, done is better than perfect. Right. And perfect's not a real thing anyway. So why are we chasing it? And I think the answer there lies in the fact that we believe again, it's stories wherever they came from. We believe somehow that we have this control over things. And we are so friggin' scared to surrender that control. That terrifies us. Yet, we never had the control to begin with. So we are clinging to just empty ideas that we can't bring to fruition anyway. 
So we have to put that need to be perfect aside, guys, because it doesn't exist. The control doesn't exist. And time is friggin' fleeting. If you actually want to do what you say you want to do in this lifetime, you have got to show up differently. And, you know, nobody cares if you missed a period in your sentence or you forgot to cross a T or you stuttered or you repeated yourself or you were a day late or whatever. Like in the scheme of things, do these things matter five minutes from now, a month from now, five years from now? Do they matter? If the answer is no, you need to give yourself some grace and start just showing up and doing your thing and stop worrying about all the little nitpicky details that are keeping you from you. They're keeping you from your best self. They're not making you better. They're not making the end product better. They're just keeping you separate from all the greatness that you're trying to achieve when you try to rein in that level of control that doesn't exist anyway. Okay. So again, needing to be busy all the time, needing to be perfectionist and just always being productive. If it kills you that a day passed and you were not feeling productive, there's probably some high functioning anxiety. I know that one still hits me because productivity is something that I, I bask in. I love a day that is both enjoyable and productive. It's like the perfect blend for me. If I can get, when I get days like that, especially if you can throw in some good focus and some good food and some family time, and it's just a little bit of everything, like that's my perfect day. They don't happen all that often. So if that's the only thing that I want to register as being a great day, I'm going to have a lot of days that I don't feel like are very great. So I have learned to, to work around that one too. And to realize that even on the days when I would want to criticize myself for not being productive, still doing more than most people do. Like I really got to give myself some grace there. So I have, and I encourage you to do the same because you're probably doing far more than you're giving yourself credit for. You are not celebrating your little wins and it's time to do that. Genuinely do that. So when you're, when you're that critical on yourself, that is another sign of high functioning anxiety. And usually it's your own expectations that you've set for yourself that you're being critical about. A lot of times it's not even something that anybody else is holding you up to. Sometimes it is, sometimes it is, but when you're putting yourself in those situations and you're putting those expectations, dialing it up super high, super perfect, super got to do it just right. You're probably also going to find that you're experiencing the symptom of not being able to relax very well at all. So, you know, it's all going to start kind of clicking with you. If you're, if you're somebody that lives in any of these States, then you, a probably have anxiety, whether you knew that or not, and B probably have high functioning anxiety and a need to appear successful is important. And comparison can come up a lot with high functioning anxiety, comparing yourself to others. And we all know that that's the thief of joy. Uh, Positive and negative comparisons are not always the way to feel better about anything. Sometimes it's impossible to avoid comparison in certain conversations, lines of work, that kind of thing. But just being more conscious of it and where it is not helpful can really be helpful. And Overthinking. Oh, this is one. This is a big, big hallmark of high functioning anxiety. Overthinking, having a hard time making decisions, and just that whole like, you know, they talk about analysis paralysis. That's that's exactly what happens a lot of times when you have high functioning anxiety and you get stuck. The stuckness is is a huge thing too. And With stuckness comes procrastination and it's this loop 
it's this loop of, you know, you want to do all the things you want to be super productive. And yet you're getting stuck. You're overanalyzing. You are completely paralyzed and you're not moving forward. So you end up with more anxiety and more frustration and, you know, more need for the over-organized, over-planned structure that you believe is going to bring you to the next thing, which comes back to that whole, it's time to be and not do and allow your energy to take a role in the accomplishment. Instead of trying to make it all a mind game, our, our mind can't heal this. This comes down to nervous system and, you know, bringing together all of our, you know, our four bodies that I talk about all the time, the mental, the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual. And that that's work worth doing guys. It is work worth doing because otherwise you get lost in the details. You get lost in the over-organization and you get lost in over-preparation. And you, you never feel ready. You never feel prepared, no matter what you do. And you never feel like it's perfect enough. So, and, and you, you don't want to appear that way because as someone who has high functioning anxiety, you want to appear efficient. You want to appear organized. You want to appear confident. You want to appear like you've got it all together. And a lot of the time you don't, and that's okay. That's okay. But it's not okay if you end up ruminating in these negative circles about the things that are not working out for you or that are not going as planned. And that can be difficult when you are in a loop of over planning. And then you've over planned and you've really, really thought about it and you know how it should work and then it doesn't. You can really start to ruminate when things get that way. And then you start worrying about the judgment from other people and all sorts of other things. And let's not forget that our high functioning anxiety can also have physical symptoms. So it's not just all this stuff that's happening in our head and our hearts. It's the stuff that's happening in our body. You can, um, you know, break out in sweats. You can have a hard time getting a deep breath and you can notice that maybe your heart feels like it's beating out of your chest. Sometimes you can also have uh, like pulled muscles, muscle tension, aches and pains in your body, all sorts of things that can manifest as a result of living in this high, high stress level. So it's definitely worth calming your nervous system so that everything can lower the resistance and feel better. And, you know, with overthinking can come like I said, the, the negative rumination, but also you can end up in a cycle of like worst case scenario type stuff in your head. And that's not helpful either, but it's a common, a common thing that happens to people with anxiety is that, you know, you end up thinking, gosh, like what's the worst thing that could happen. And then you start kind of living that scenario out in your head and you forget to play the opposite game, which is what's the best thing that could happen. And that's a fun game to play versus what's the worst thing that can happen. It can also um, show up with like, you know, you can be like a nail biter or other, you know, negative habits. Maybe you um, always have to be chewing gum or you're like chewing the caps on your pens or doing some kind of a nervous habit, you know, picking at your cuticles or um, some people like bite their lip or end up with these things that are almost like ticks that they just kind of do over and over again. And that isn't awesome either. Right. Uh, definitely worth checking your habits to see if they feel like they're being driven by nervous energy, by anxious energy, um, by a need to appear or show up in a way that is honestly above and beyond what humans are supposed to do. And this is also another area where it can get a little confusing with ADHD because the focus and the concentration can be hard when you're anxious. So a lot of times people have ADHD, they also have anxiety and 
sometimes only one gets diagnosed and not the other because symptoms can be similar. You know, it's the same thing with trauma and ADHD. There's a lot of similar symptoms going on there. And sometimes people don't realize that they have both and they only think they have one or the other. And there's different ways to treat each of them and different modalities that can be helpful. So again, it's just one of those areas where some increased consciousness can really make a really big difference and help you to be able to relax better, to be able to sleep better, because a lot of times anxiousness can lead to sleep disruptions, insomnia, and just not getting that really restful sleep or enough hours. I know that for me, insomnia showed up hardcore when uh, my youngest was I think it was about when I was pregnant with him. And then that first year, and of course it was easy to say it's because I'm pregnant. It's because I have a newborn. It's because they're waking up so much and I'm waking up. But even when I could sleep, I couldn't let go of my thoughts enough to get good sleep. And it was during that time that I came back to essential oils and crystals and meditation in a, in a more in-depth way. I was already meditating daily and it was still like not enough. And I learned about binaural beats and self-hypnosis and so many other things that I still use and employ to this day that are majorly, majorly helpful. And I sleep so well these days. It's amazing to, to go from feeling helpless about being able to sleep and you know how it is, especially when you have a baby or young kids and you know that like your day, even if, I mean, for me, cause I'm, I'm work at home mom. So technically if I didn't have other people to worry about, I could sleep when I need to sleep and I could be awake when I need to be awake. But when you're, when you're a mom in general, like you just don't have that flexibility. And when you have a baby and they wake up when they want to, and they're upset about something or they need to eat or whatever, there's, you have no control even less than normal over when you get to sleep, rest, and do the things that you want to do in the order that you want to do them, which is triggering for people with ADHD and anxiety, both of which really benefit from routine. So just mentioning that for any you know new moms out there or just moms in general, sometimes those, those younger years with kids can be really, really difficult when you have anxiety or ADHD. Because while we love babies, sometimes the baby phase is a huge challenge to our organization, our need for routine, and it can really elevate anxiety, insomnia, a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, those are all, those are all symptoms and ways that this shows up. And I just wanted to make you guys aware of that and kind of introduce this a little bit better on this episode, because again, I feel like I haven't talked about it enough and I know that most of those things that I just talked about are things that definitely were symptoms for me that I didn't, didn't realize for like way longer than I'd like to admit. That's for sure. So again, high functioning anxiety isn't a diagnosis, but if you related to a lot of those things and were like, oh God, yeah, that's me for sure. Then you might want to start looking for some solutions. I highly recommend EFT or any of those things that I just talked about that helped me get through my insomnia and any kind of coaching or therapy that is going to help you love, accept, forgive yourself, and to learn how to get present. Anxiousness and worry never have you seated in the present moment. And as you guys have heard me say so many times, you're probably sick of hearing it. The present moment is the only place that we have any power. So if you are giving all your power away to worry and anxiety and a need to be some kind of perfect overachiever, you're not showing up in the present moment. You're not being the powerful woman that you want to be and show up as. And I know that's not what you want. So finding ways, whether it's through, you know, self-help or therapy or 
working with an EFT practitioner like myself to look at this differently. And most importantly, to not just work through it on the mental level, but on the full body and nervous system level so that you can really release those energetic blockages that are such a big part of this. And then you'll find yourself able to show up better, to perform better, to have the boundaries that perhaps you've been missing, to manage your to-do list, your time, your organization better, and to become ultimately free of your anxiety, or at the very least, able to successfully manage it. I don't just mean like recognize I have anxiety and call it a day. I mean, recognize you have it and learn ways to lower that stress, lower that resistance and live with a new ease and grace that you haven't understood or allowed yourself previously. It's huge, 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 huge. Okay. And you've got to be able to learn to, to break away from, from the work and the busyness and just be able to sit with yourself and be with yourself and love that person, that soul, that being that you are sitting with and really, really accept her for all that she is and all that she's been through. You know, there's usually some trauma wrapped up in this too, guys. So, you know, if you've, if you've come to a place where you feel stuck, if you're procrastinating, if you're beaten up on yourself and you're feeling anxious and you're ready to get to the root of it, like let's chat for real, like go to gamechangingconversation.com and let's have a real conversation about this and how you can work through it in ways that are really going to impact your life in a positive way. And in the meantime, I'm rooting for you. I know you can do it. Hey, if I, if I can do it, you can do it. And I'm excited to do it together. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for listening. If you loved this episode, please share it with a friend or post on social media and tag me so I can personally connect and thank you. Until next time, keep taking bold and brave action steps towards becoming more of who you want to be in this world. You are capable, you are worthy, and you are enough. Keep shining your light.